Very good. Well, here we are. It is uplink number uh, 21. And I just want to thank everyone for joining us. And indeed, uh, Mark McCorkran, uh, how the time flies. I cannot believe we have 21 <laughs> episodes of uplink. Under, uh, that is just a, a number, isn't it? Anyway, how are you doing? Oh, good, good. Probably a little bit cooler than you guys over in the UK today. Uh, we didn't quite get the same Saharan scorcher, but uh, not quite. Third, I think we got 34 still. Anyway. Well, I, I don't know what you're talking about, Mark. I'm in outer space, clearly. And um, <laughs> and you are standing in front of one of the most powerful ships in the known galaxy. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? <laughs> well, since this evening's um, uh, uplink, we're going to be talking about poetry uh, and the link to space. Uh, behind me here is the one of the ships of the Vogon Constructor, f constructor Fleet uh, hovering over Jodrell Bank, which you can see there in the background. So there's your... Uh, science fiction and science connection and of course the Vogons were famously the third worst poets in the galaxy so uh, um, they use poetry as a form of torture and hopefully this evening that won't be the case for us but uh, I was thinking space and poetry it's got to be the Vogons. Indeed well I mean it certainly is a first for us I mean uh, we were just talking about uh, doing 21 episodes of Uplink but you know this is an area that we haven't really dive into, you know, quite in the same way, you know, I mean, so much of, uh, you know, Space Rock's activity has been around music, you know, we touch on art, touch on politics, and, and many, many things, but there is this other really important intersection, not with science fiction literature, of course, but with poetry. Yeah, and I think, you know, it, it, it wouldn't take anybody very long to think of some poems that they might have heard as a kid, or that they know, where you know, the stars and the moon and the sky play a role in that. And, and it's, you know, poetry is a very sort of primal form of storytelling um, in, in many ways. I mean, so with music, of course, it's, it's poetry set uh, set to a rhythm or set to, to instruments. So I think, you know, you're right. It's a bit of a um, an omission on our part that we haven't got to it sooner, but it's always been there, I think, in the background. I think, you know, poetry is something which, it's very often sort of thought to be a formal school thing where, you know, you learn it and then you give it up. But actually, you know, it's there's a there's a poetry uh, in literature. There's a poetry in the way we consider the universe. So what better than, you know, to actually have a real poet come on and tell us how he uh, transforms the universe into words on a written page. Indeed. Well, I mean, it is such a fascinating area, um, primarily, you know, because, you know, uh, I guess we're set to be educated, aren't we? So what can you tell us about <laughs> Lucy Green and Simon Barraclough, I mean, truly, uh, you know, just a dynamo that we have on the show tonight. Well, Lucy is familiar to many people in astronomy, perhaps, and, and, and uh, solar science. She's a solar physicist, originally trained as an astronomer, but, I mean, you have something else to add to that when you introduce her in a moment. Um, she's at the Mullard Space Science Lab, which is in the south of England. Um, she's a very well-known science communicator. Uh, um, has done lots of documentary shows, but uh, The Sky at Night... Um, uh, and is involved in amateur astronomy as well as the uh, um, supporting activities, for example, Astrofest, which our friend Stuart Clark uh, is involved with as well, and um, astronomy magazine run. So she is somebody that's very well aware of the intersection between art and science with her communication work. And, and Simon, I think she knows, she may have met him before, but he was, uh, he's a poet, um, uh, and he was an artist in residence at the Mullard Space Science Lab oh, six years ago or so now and, and wrote poetry linking not just solar physics, the sun, um, looking at that, but also cosmology and other areas of astronomy and space science. And I know they've worked together before um, and discussed the issue we're going to talk this evening, where the intersection is. So I'm really, and I, I haven't heard them talking about that together, so I'm really excited to hear what they have to say because they both have a strong background at that intersection point where where space rocks lives indeed indeed well i guess without further ado we should uh bring them aboard and uh, i guess uh, prepare to sit back and be bowled over with the lyrical <laughs> genius you know the, the words about the stars there we are lucy and we and we and immediately Simon. see that Lu lucy is using uh <laughs> she switched <laughs> switched accounts very quickly <laughs> Just <changed it. laughs> how are you <laughs> very good lucy <laughs> Very well. Uh, uh, Simon and Lucy, uh, welcome to the Hello. program. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Can I just double check that you are both receiving? Uh, I think so, yes. Okay, good. <laughs> good. Now, some, receiving some arms. 
Good news, good news. Well, um, well, look, we have so much to talk about. Um, you know, uh, well, Mark was just, uh, of course, you know, referencing, you know, the the third worst post in the galaxy, of course, the Bogons occupying the ship behind him, certainly. But uh, but there is so much to talk about. I wondered if I could start with Lucy, actually, because I was reading a little bit about, you know, your your beginnings, Lucy, and um, I was really interested to read because, of course, anyone who knows anything about space rocks knows we are all about the intersection of science and the arts, whatever forms they may take. And so I was really interested to read that before you settled on physics, um, that you began with art. So I, I guess it sounds like you you probably agree with us. I do. So I, I had a sort of um, being pulled in different directions when I was younger. And physics, I always loved. I loved the problem solving. I loved the challenge of that, thinking creatively. But then with art as well, it's the same and overlapping skill sets that you use. And I was, um, I, I had a real struggle in secondary school as to where to focus my attention. And when I was approaching the age to leave school, art was the area that pulled more strongly. So my plan at that, what, at, at that point in time was to go off and become an art therapist. So I loved my A-level art. I got my best A-level grade in A-level art, not in physics. Um, and then I went off to do an art foundation course after that. And I just, I don't know, I just, I love the freedom. I love the, the creativity and I love the expression but that comes into art. But then I sort of couldn't see myself quite going into a career in that area. So after doing art for a year, then I switched to do astrophysics and kind of kept the art as a hobby, which, you know, lots of people said to me, oh, you can always have it that way around. And maybe it's harder to do a career in art and have physics as a hobby, which actually I don't think is the case anymore with all the citizen science activities that happen. But I like to have both of those in my sort of worldview and in my sphere. Yeah. So just a quick question for me, because, you know, I, I, how easy was that technically to make that transfer? Was that, did you actually reapply to go somewhere else? Or were you able to do that within the same institution where you were studying art? That's, that's pretty remarkable. I don't think most people would be able to do that today. Yeah, so I, I went to a different institution. And it's funny now, because I kind of call my year doing art my, my gap year. <laughs> <laughs> you know many people would take a gap year and go traveling or you know earn money but I just happened to do mine um studying art and actually a level maths because I didn't do a level maths at school I only did as level maths so I think that kind of following my nose but I, I was lucky it worked out because I did already have the a levels at a level in physics then I would I had what I needed to go to university yeah so it, it wasn't too much of a sort of left field turn or a stretch for me yeah okay well, I mean, I, I guess this is the thing, though, isn't it? You know, I mean, because so many people treat it like a dichotomy. But Simon, I wondered what your thoughts were, of course, because, you know, you've got so much background in this world. I mean, in, in many ways, aren't these worlds in some sense almost intertwined? You know, I mean, science reveals, uh, you know, things, but, you know, things like poetry express things about how we feel. Uh, absolutely. I've always seen these two dichotomous worlds as intertwined or sometimes one and the same uh, or they, they share kind of shifting membranes and um, you know poetry searches for things science searches for things and we express ourselves through art and also through science I mean all scientists express their personality their interests um, their past histories through the research that they do and the ideas that they come up with so um, I've never felt that dichotomy, I've experienced it, of course, a lot over the course of the years, because it's since um, maybe early 19th century times or mid 19th century times, they have kind of been divided through curriculums and through institutional um, organization. Uh, and when I was coming back to what Lucy was saying about the arts and the physics and, and the maths, I was I was really good at physics up until the age of about 15, 16, 17 to the point where my physics teacher wanted me to take it forward and do a degree in it. But at a, but at a certain point, my mathematics, my kind of pure mathematics started falling away quite dramatically. And it, and it, and it became clear that I probably didn't have the mathematical skills to do physics at university, but I'd always also being obsessed with language and I'd been writing stories and poetry and I was, I was, I was good at history and English. So I kind of had this, this, this weird parting of the ways at a certain point. Um, I was always very keen on astronomy as, as a little boy, 
but um, I'm from a, a working class family in West Yorkshire. Um, they didn't know, my parents didn't know, and I didn't know that you, actually you could become an astronomer by doing certain things. For me, an astronomer was like a mystical role. It's like it's out there. They're, they're, it's chosen by the gods. There's a Newton and there's a Galileo and like they just become that. I can't do that. There's no path to doing that for, from being a little boy in, in Huddersfield in West Yorkshire. Um, of course, now I know there is, um, but I kind of found my way back to it through through poetry and through literature and, and, and language somehow. So um, these things never kind of leave you. And I, I haven't really done it deliberately to mesh these two fields. I'm proud of the fact that I do do that because I think it's an important thing um, to happen and for people to realize it's not a stark choice. You can still do both. You can run them together. Um, you can be a, a great scientist and a great poet at the same time. Many examples, you know, Miroslav Holub, Rebecca Elson, of course, um, are both of those things. Um, and um, if I'd been better at maths, I wonder if I'd have gone down a physics track and would I have come back to the poetry? I think I probably would have done, actually. Um, I've now rambled way off course, um, but but in terms of, of that dichotomy, no, I, I, I think it is there, but it but it's it shouldn't really be there, and it, and it's and it should be broken down, and it's quite easy to break down if if you if you if you open your mind and um, give it a shot. Which mm. is something that Lucy and I have kind of done together in our work over the years, mm. is to try and try and cross pollinate or break through some of those perceived barriers, mm. and and of course you know Freud would tell us that these perceptions are very very powerful things indeed you know they're not always easily swept aside i mean it does require some work mm. yeah. so, so before we go i mean into that the, the intersection I, I was really taken with something you said there simon about this idea that you know it was inconceivable that you be, could become one of those things and and one might argue that's something which is in the past you know, that with all the work that's done on science communication now or the television, and you know, I mean, everybody can kind of see astronomers being a little bit, you know, less you know, smoking a pipe and standing next to a big machine. I mean, they're like normal people now to some extent. But, but, I mean, that's why I picked up on it. I remember having a long conversation with uh, um, Dominique Tipper. She's a, an actor who is in the uh, TV series, The Expanse. Uh, and oh, she, nice. she, came, she, she came on stage with us at Space Rocks last September. And I had a long conversation with her the day before about how we can, as in Space Rocks, but the broader community, how we can reach into schools um, in places like East of London, where she's from and elsewhere, because she says this is still a very prevalent thing, that people are basically told way too early, you cannot be one of those things. And it might be a scientist, it might be an actor, it might be something else. But you know, there's, the expectation is, is, is given to you, even if you see people who look like you being it. No, no, you can't do that. Um, it, it's not for you. And I wonder if, you know, that's something you've encountered yourselves. I mean, and Lucy, you did a lot of outreach work. So it, 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 that, that seems to me kind of scary that that's still a problem. Yeah, it is. I think, yeah, you can't become something you don't know exists. And then you've got that added external influence. And it might be from schools, it might be from friends, it might be from family that no, that's, that's not the path for you. So I think that's where the power of role models comes in. But I think they need to be accessible. Sometimes I worry that people who are put forward as role models or become role models are so extraordinary, you know, they're so brilliant. And I think, gosh, that we just need it to be that everybody can feel that they can take the path that they want. And then the other thing that was running through my mind, um, while you were talking was so as well as doing outreach i work with um a school in london ucl academy that and we try and break down those barriers between disciplines by teaching around themes and sort of big ideas rather than just having you know physics over here or music over here there are opportunities all the time in in the way the school teaches to bring everything together and have students reflect on where the the intersections are between these areas and i think that's really important and and um, really sort of crucial way to get young people thinking in a in a broader more connected way so we call it the connected curriculum because we're trying to make these links across the different areas mm. also, uh, sorry. sorry go ahead simon please no i was just thinking that a, a, another job another role or position um that people don't think they can do or don't think they can achieve is to be a writer or in fact a poet i've had i've had I've had scientists say to me, 
they've reflected that that whole position back to me. I've said to them, I thought, you know, you couldn't become, I didn't know how you'd become a poet or, a, sorry, an astronomer or a scientist, cosmologist. And they said, well, that's how, that's how I always felt about, you know, being a writer or a published writer or a poet or whatever. They're, again, they're kind of, they're both kind of mythical figures in a way, unless you get people coming into your local schools who, who sit down on a desk and say, well, I'm a writer, here are my books, and they'll read stuff to you, or a scientist going in and doing exactly the same thing. And as soon as you see someone who is um, maybe not such a extraordinary role model as, as Lucy was, was mentioning, but, you know, a real flesh and blood person who enjoys what they do, who's inspiring, who can come in and talk to you um, for an afternoon, then you kind of realise, oh, actually, you know, maybe I, maybe I could do that. And um, I think when I was... Um, at school, we did have a couple of writers who came in and just chatted to us, local writers, um, who'd had stories published and books out. And suddenly it, it, it became something that maybe I could, I could aspire to that. So I think just a little bit of, of contact at that level um, doesn't have to be life changing. You just need to know it's, it's kind of in the mix there. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's one of the many things available to you. I once had, a, when I was at school, I, once, I did one of those Cascade career choice computer program thing is and um the job that i am most suited for apparently was a boatyard manager and uh <laughs> and i was living in huddersfield which is you know it's about as far from the sea on either side as, as you can. i do actually quite like sailing as it happens but and i'm fascinated by boats but um, well um in reference uh, briefly to something you said earlier simon um because um you were saying that you were rambling and going in fact, that that's um, you weren't rambling, and we love going off piste on um, this. Oh, show. good. So, um, but you said that, so I thought I'd oblige. There is no, there is no thematic constraint on what we can talk about. So I just thought I'd lob a grenade in here. Sure. Um, I read earlier in the week that here in the UK, um, there is a decision being made to make poetry optional um, in the uh, uh, GCSEs and the curriculum and so on, which. You know, I imagine you and I think all of us probably have strong feelings about, um, you know, given what it can do, just as an yes. intellectual and spiritual lens on, on the world. I have quite strong and quite complicated feelings about it, actually, because I, I deal with lots of adults who were put off poetry um, around the kind of GCSE era where there where poetry was presented as a kind of puzzle or um, something to break down or something that had a hidden meaning that you had to kind of extricate from it um so poetry is often there are brilliant poetry teachers around of course but um i there are a lot of people who who, who kind of suffered over poetry a lot around that time um now of course i'm not saying that it shouldn't be taught i think it's uh it's a uh, it's a terrible decision to take away one of the great strands of english literature um, which is poetry and uh, these people who were doing this, I mean, I, I understand it's possibly just for a year. Um, and, it's, and it's partly to do with, with staffing and numbers and opening up schools after the whole pandemic. So we have to do less of certain things and more of other things, I guess. Um, but the people who make this decision are the first people to turn to, you know, Blake and Tennyson and, you know, Shakespeare. And, you know, um, they go for a certain genre of poetry to back up their ideas um, and have probably very little knowledge of, of how rich and deep it is and, and how, how it gives people um, a chance to talk about experiences which are not covered in the media or, or uh, you know, to talk about things um, in creative and imaginative, rhythmic, beautiful, passionate ways um, that they wouldn't otherwise do. Um, so it's, uh, I mean, I think it's, 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 uh, it's a poor decision, um, but I have complicated feelings having, having learnt poetry, taught poetry, and, uh, and dealt with, uh, I mean, a lot of the scientists at the Space Lab where Lucy and I worked um, were really scared of poetry because of what they went through when they were 14 or 15 years mm -hmm. old. Um, I remember the first session I ran um, at the Space Lab back in 2014, um, a very brilliant, um, it, was, it was Debs, um, I forget her surname, but Debs, who's a solar physicist, who I think left finance to go into astrophysics, um, came up to me beforehand and she said, I'm coming to your session, Simon, but you're not going to ask me anything, are you? You don't, you know, you're not going to put me on the spot. And she was, she was really nervous about, about confronting poetry. And I was terrified because I was teaching poetry to, you know, kind of 12, 16 amazing scientists who I was in awe of. But we both had this, this kind of weird dread of each other. And, uh, and of course, you know, I didn't put anyone on the spot and so we, 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 we worked at it in a very organic way. Um, but I mean, poetry is, poetry is absolutely vital. It's one of the first things um, children enjoy, you know, nursery rhymes, things that rhyme, things with rhythm. It's very allied to music. Um, there are lots of skills involved in, in writing and, and uh, 
reacting, responding to poetry. Um, and it's not just about what does this mean, it's about, you know, how does this sound? Um, I think that that was one of the joyous things of so so the collaboration that Simon's referring to at the Space Lab um, was a, an initiative to try and bring people together to think about language to write poetry together to make new links across the department and use something that is accessible to everybody and it's a kind of you know putting everybody on the same level within the science and engineering department so you know and, and get you out of your silos but it was interesting because I know I, I was the same I hadn't really read poetry since well in fact since doing the art foundation when I became a bit obsessed with the poetry of Brian Patton and um but after that I kind of left it to one side and I felt like I wasn't equipped to appreciate poetry or understand it which is a really weird way to think about it now and what Simon was able to do was kind of ignite that fun in poetry and just to enjoy it and not try and as you said decode it or understand it or bring out a hidden meaning which actually thinking about it was one of the reasons why I turned away from art to physics and um, I remember people trying to read more into what I was creating than I was necessarily intending and I found that a bit frustrating you know this was my vision for it this was my motivation and I get that it's it can be in the eye of the beholder when I see other arts I want to get from it what I want to get from it but it was very different when I had people talking to me directly trying to tell me what they thought I was trying to convey and it's like no 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 that's not what I'm trying to do. Uh -huh. um, well, no, I think it, you know, <laughs> it, it, it's strange isn't it though that we we persist with an education system which is um concentrates on the ability to measure things to examine things to have somebody else mark something you've done and so as you just said lucy right what you might take from a piece of art from a piece of poetry from a painting you know you might write it, it it's terrible or it's you know I, I love it but i can't tell you why those are perfectly valid responses but you would never pass an exam on that because the teacher or the examiner will say tell me why you know i i, I need to be able to assess and I think that's, you know, probably we've fallen into that, that problem of just setting bits of poetry, which actually do have meaning maybe behind them, which can be decoded because somebody did it or the poet said, yes, that's what I meant. Um, and, it, and it becomes, a, you know, just another way of ticking boxes. Uh, and, and how, how do we, but it was also motivated to me because we had an artist in residence program at, here at EsTech in the Netherlands, and we'll, we'll start doing it again next year. We had exactly the same experience with a, um, uh, plastic artists, you know, somebody that works with with sculpture and with painting and so on. Um, and, and she experienced exactly the same thing. She invited the scientists and they all stood in the corner go, oh, I'm not really sure. I, it's not just you talk over there. Right. It's a seminar, isn't it? It's like, no, get your hands dirty. <laughs> and I wonder again what you, what you've experienced. You know, where does that cut off occur? If you go into schools um, when kids are five, they don't see a difference between physics and, and poetry and running around the playground. But at some point it does get set in. And then we get stuck. So where should we concentrate our efforts in fostering the, the art science crossover? Is it is it too late with adults? I don't think so, but just to be provocative. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, I'm a believer in lifelong learning. So I think there's something for every level and what you probably need and appreciate at different points in your life then changes. But I think if you, if you, don't have the opportunity to engage that's it's natural then that you start to lose interest because you're not being stimulated in in a way that and um, gives you an enjoyment um, but i think a lot of the sort of practices and mindsets are set when you're at school so i would definitely encourage students education at primary secondary level to be more open across the subjects and less siloed and I think you know there's a big change between primary and secondary in the way that um, maybe kind of the philosophy I mean I'm not a teacher so any teachers listening might scream at you know the computers right now but I always feel if I go if I do outreach in a primary school I can play I can play with them I can take in I don't know uh, old toilet rolls or egg cartons and and make science you know I don't know make a Mars lander out of old junk that you've got lying around too you can play but when you try and do that in a secondary school so I you know I take in cardboard boxes and try and make spectroscopes there's a completely like well well that's not what we do in secondary school we're, we're book work and you know we're learning and we're more academic 
And so for me, that is a challenge because I think that sense of play should be there throughout your life. And it shouldn't be something that's in primary and then is somehow not the sort of approach in, in secondary. I mean, I get why it is how it is now but I think that sense of play is what you shouldn't lose and then again coming back to poetry being playful which is what Simon really taught me um you've got that in your kind of toolkit of life uh, and that you can draw on yeah I mean, I mean play play exists absolutely everywhere doesn't it it's how we learn it's how we learned the first things we ever learned. I think it's through play. It's how animals learn, you know to survive and to hunt and, 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 and interact with other other creatures so um, playfulness. Um, if there's room in the curriculum and, and the very, maybe we need to relax some of the um, the schedules and the and the milestones a little bit and have you know, almost like mini mini gap years. Like if you're studying a language, you have a, a year of that country. Maybe if you're doing a physics course, you have a month where you you deal with the poetry around that subject. Or you know, little, little kind of like breakout areas. I quite like the way that. Um, don't books organize their shops where they go by country now there's there's many different ways of organizing of course but they go by country so under egypt they will have um books of um narrative travel in egypt they'll have novels they'll have poetry they'll have maps they'll have anecdotes they'll have memoirs so there's there's like it becomes this it's a cross cross disciplinary kind of section to that um the area and I think there are ways of breaking down or at least maybe just loosening the edges of uh, you know unbolting some of the some of the tight separation uh, compartments between between languages uh, sorry between subjects um language is an obsession of mine so it keeps slipping in um but talking about silo thinking I when I went to into the space lab it was very interesting because there were people who were who worked in adjacent offices at the space lab I got them to come to a poetry meeting a discussion a reading or whatever we were doing that day and um, I just assumed they knew each other but I was introducing them to each other you know and they were they were like they were right next door but they had different disciplines and different routines and maybe went to the cafeteria at, the, at, the, at, the, at different times so one of the one of the one of the this this word disruption is, is I think is quite toxic at the moment given what we're going through but um, going into the space lab was I was a bit of a disruptive influence, um, partly because I was a bit chaotic because I didn't I was kind of working as I went along. But also I, I got different groups of people, engineers and cosmologists and people who didn't interact to get together and, and, and collaborate. So we wrote things together in groups of eight or 10 sometimes and read them together. And um, all these weird barriers kind of broke down. So I guess there's a there are ways to break down those kind of divisions, um, either on a personal or a, or, or a subject matter level. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it's so interesting to hear you say that and to you know extend the magnificent bookshop Daunt Books <laughs> a little further. So um, so you you enter you know we've just bought Daunt Books and um, you know we're going to reorganize it in certain ways, and you walk into the space section. Um, uh -huh. So what belongs in that section? We're going to have books about um, scientific discoveries and so on, but, but what, what else would you populate that section with? Uh, so wow. we get that same feeling of immersion in, in that subject field across the arts. Mine and Lucy's books, obviously, <laughs> uh, immediately. Um, things like, you know, things about um, deep sea exploration, um, things about um, you know, the, the birth of, of life, of biology, um, things like Samuel Beckett's um, late, very short fiction, which is which is very very spatially oriented, often in a very abstract space. Um, CDs, music, and films that deal with 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 space itself, and also uh, our sense of of spaciousness. That would be my opening. <laughs> my that would be my brainstorming notes at the at our first bookshop meeting. Fantastic. Well, I mean, that, that, that's so interesting and such a, I think, a great and stimulating way of looking at it all because, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think disruption can mean different things to different people, but maybe it's really cross-pollination that we're talking about. Yeah, I think so. Out. I think, I think, yeah, just melting, just, just making some things a bit, a bit more porous and uh, yeah. being able to push on something and, and go with it rather than be, than be bounced back, perhaps. Mm -hmm. And see where that takes you. And if it takes you somewhere, yeah. you know, you don't particularly want to go, you can always come back and go down another, another channel. I think it's also, I, I was just sort of 
um, thinking about the fact that you know, some people are more comfortable with technical ways of approaching things. And if you if you give them the freedom to, to create, they, they maybe lack a bit of structure to begin with, which they can use as a crutch and then dispense with. And just reminded me that when I first uh, went on Twitter um, five years ago, um, we're all old enough. Remember, it used to be only 140 characters instead of the, yes. you can't, you can write novels on it now, but you know, in those days you had to be a bit more um, concise. And one of the first things I started doing more is just as a kind of an exercise to think of something to do was, was writing haiku. Uh, yes. which because of the the five seven five syllable structure at least in one version of haiku and the need to have this what is it is it i'm going to say it wrong is it kiregi the breaking with the, the stop um sound before the last yeah, it's like the, the cutting word is the that, you know? cutting word exactly and then this idea that there should be nature mixed with some sign of sense of time mm. and so i actually wrote a whole bunch of haiku which i could fit into 140 characters yeah. about our various space missions i mean don't ask me to quote any of them they but probably weren't very yeah. good but 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 it because it was almost a kind of a, a mathematical exercise to make it fit mm -hmm. into the length and with the, 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 the syllable structure, it provided me a starting point to then yeah. put the creativity on top of it. Uh, I mean, maybe there are exercises like that, which you've probably done, right, with the people. Oh, at the, yeah, the I mean, loads of them. I mean, you know, um, the best thing to unleash people's creativity is to impose restrictions on them so that you, you have something to work with immediately. You know, I think, I, I can't remember who it was. Was it some Robert Frost who said, free versus like playing tennis without a net. Hmm. Um, it's actually when you have nothing but infinite choice, you know, you're kind of, you're, you're semi-paralyzed. I was, I was thinking about this the other day. I was at, um, I was. Oh, I think um, we might've just had a brief pause there. Um, a the few months of lockdown there. And um, there's so much choice. I think. I we're suffering out outages on you, Simon, I think. Yeah, um, yeah, could be the heat, but we'll wait for Simon to come back. But, uh, you know, I wondered, um, Lucy, if you could... Yeah, I think I had a little... <laughs> yeah. Hopefully I'm back. It's very warm here tonight. <laughs> yeah, it might be doing something. But, yeah, but you, you, you just too much choice can be motion. paralyzing, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah. Indeed. And often we're, we're talking about going to schools and working with children again. Um, I, sometimes I go into school, I used to, I haven't, I haven't done it for a few years now, but used to go into schools, um, like 13, 14, 15 year olds, and, uh, and we get them to write a poem and oh my God, I oh, can't write a poem. Then I would give them like 12 rules for 12 lines. So they had to follow a specific rule for each line. And then they would, they would end up, because there's a concrete thing to do and you know what to do, they would end up with really interesting poetry after you know half an hour because they've got these this direction to do it. And then, mm -hmm. then you can play with it and do something with it later. You know, um, At the Space Lab, I got people to do automatic writing. So they would start writing for five minutes yeah. down. And um, some of them got really interesting ideas and uh, dredged up memories from, from the past. And, you know, all oh, kinds oh, of it. Poetry is psychology so as well. You had a whole bunch of... <laughs> Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, I, I thought the 140 characters for Twitter was a really creative little, it's still quite good at, at what it is now, but uh, I used to like writing 140 character tweets, you know. So. Exactly. Like yes. trying, no, trying no, to use editing them all to up. get exactly, yeah. No. Exactly. Just every now and then. That's, that's, that's the slightly geeky side of, uh, you know, scientists are often called geeks, but poets can be quite geeky when it comes to those kind of formal um, games, like <clears throat> algorithms. Yeah, well, um, I wanted to, I mean, just to, just to sort of, uh, again, just uh, bring in another dimension to all this, just just what the group might think about this. Um, as, as Mark knows, one of one of my favorite, um, you know, books on the history of, um, you know, astronauts, at least, is a book called Moon Dust, um, written by a wonderful British journalist. Um, and and he, he kind of remarked how the, the problem with Apollo, just as an example, was simply that what these astronauts were seeing was so beyond the scope of human experience that it's not that they weren't moved by it, but finding the language to express what they had seen was such a challenge um, that it, it just, they, they, they ended up internalizing all of these emotions and so on. And I just wonder what the, what the group thought about that, you know, just where it's not just about celebrating, you know, these inspirations, but also just, just as in the interest of making more well-rounded humans, you know, to educate people and share um, not just the sciences, but also the arts, in that way because you know what they were really trying to do was express what was inexpressible because nobody had seen anything like that before 
Mm, yeah, and that, that for me is a really interesting point because when we're using communication, when we're communicating with people, no matter what it's about, you draw on what's familiar to you. And then suddenly with the Apollo missions, you're in an environment where you've got nothing that's familiar to you. So how, how do you describe the surface and the topology of the moon? Do you talk about a beach or a, you know, a volcano or a, I don't know, whatever. Um, so I, I can see exactly why you struggle. And I just, the things that was running through my mind when you were talking was that one of the reasons it was so great to have Simon working with us was because I wanted us to think about how we use language and so for us to convey something that's actually inherently mathematical um, with astrophysics and space science, but how, how, how do we use what is a kind of terrestrial familiar language to talk about things that are extraterrestrial and extraordinary? So yes, the Apollo astronauts going to the moon, but it could be a cosmologist looking at some part of the galaxy or someone like me looking at the sun. And we're seeing all these new things that we don't have the vocabulary to um, sort of use to digest and then convey to somebody else. So we end up using all these terrestrial words like you know, we might see something on the sun and we call it solar rain, or coronal rain. It's like, well, that, it, that's actually completely misleading because it's, it's not rain, it's not a liquid, mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's a plasma. And, and, and then you sort of start to, when you start to unpick it, you realize that you're not really doing justice to what you're trying to explain mm -hmm. and what you're trying to convey. Um, and, I, and I really struggle with that. And I'm not even an, an, you know, an Apollo astronaut. So it must have been so hard for them. But, but you are a uh, brilliant science communicator, you know, and I guess it's just, you know, frequently speaking with Mark about so many of these things as well, you know, finding the right words to convey the vastness, the remoteness, everything else is so essential to it all. And I, I think, you know, especially with kids, you know, in outreach, and all that, you know, just populating their imaginations is really important. And so it's not about <clears throat> trivializing things. It's about, it's about creating, um, you know, it's, it's making it accessible, getting people excited about it and, and moved by it as well, right? Yeah. But, I, yeah. but I, if, I, if I pick up on what Lucy said, though, I think there is, you know, because right at the very beginning, right, there's this very quite often trite thing that we, humans will understand space better when we send poets into space than when we send, you know, fighter pilots and, and engineers. And again, that sort of almost is patronizing in a way because it basically says, you know, these fighter pilots, they don't have a creative bone in their bodies. Some came back and did art. They did paintings. And, and frankly, some of the things are so unimaginable that even a poet can't really describe them. You end up going to sort of metaphors and similes, which, like you said, Lucy, you know, coronal rain or the sun is on fire. Well, it's not. It's not there's no, no oxygen there. It's not burning at all. And I worry a little bit that sometimes we overreach with outreach. Do you know what I mean? That we kind of try to make it accessible to the point that it becomes a Chinese meal. You feel very satisfied at the end of it and you feel hungry about an hour later because you think, actually, what did they just say? I have this thing called big numberology, which I hate, right? We do, we all do it all the time. Oh, this comet was going at 100,000 miles an hour. Yeah, and? It doesn't mean anything, right? I mean, how, I can't imagine that number and it's not actually moving in that way. It just sounds like a big number. So everybody goes, wow. So I'm a bit worried that sometimes, I mean, so how do you find that, how do you find the balance there, making it accessible, but not to the point of trivializing it, perhaps in your work, Simon? My, my favorite thing is, um, is when they say a teaspoon of this material would be X, Y, or Z, you know, a teaspoon of this material would go straight through the earth at the speed of something, or a teaspoon of this material would weigh more than, more than the total known mass in the universe. So I, I, it's a bit like a country the size of Wales that people often use as, a, as an analogy. I don't know, I mean, language is, language is slippery and uh it, it's a web that relies on 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 differences between you know phonemes i mean you go into semiotics and the work of ferdinand de Saussure, you realize that language actually doesn't mean anything it's a, it's dependent on what it doesn't mean as, as much as what it does so you end up in this this endless web of trying to trying to capture reality through language so we talk about you know it's it's impossible to talk about the first view of the earth from the Apollo missions or whatever. It's also impossible to talk about, you know, the phone on my desk or whatever, you know, language doesn't necessarily deliver what you wanted to do at any stage. So we're all kind of in the same boat. It seems more challenging when you're looking at an amazing, and I don't know where that, I don't know where that sublimeness comes from. I don't know why looking at 
at, at Neptune is so much more sublime than looking at a book on my shelf because they're both kind of miraculous really to me and um, and whatever words I use you know they don't really pin it down in either way um, when I was writing my book Sunspots I, I realized that um, very quickly this is probably the most written about object uh, in, in in history in human history you know it's it's everywhere it's in psalms it's in poems it's an everyday chat it's something we talk about every day um, and so my 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 mission became to write about the sun in as many different ways as I possibly could um, maybe in ways that people hadn't hadn't tried yet so to try and get try and get an angle on the sun by proliferating descriptions of it and hoping that that would kind of disturb the field um, and get people excited about this 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 everyday object which is also maybe the most exciting object we will encounter in our lives but we take it for granted we complain about it we forget about it most of the time um, we hear about it on weather reports on radio four in the morning where it's expressed as oh you're lucky if it's there and it's, it's a sad day for you if it's not um but i think well it's the only star that we can actually see the surface of we can you know it's uh, i remember being at the space lab someone told me that every other star is like a point source whereas our star, we can actually look at the surface of it. And this is, of course, is where Lucy's work takes off, where Lucy gets so excited. But when I was writing the book, I remember not, not being able to sleep at night. I was so excited about it and thinking, why doesn't everyone feel feel like this? You know? Do you not realize, you know, just, <laughs> no matter what else is going on in your life, do you know, do you know where you are, what you've got out there and what it's doing, you know? So, and, and my way to, I mean, I did work with um, musicians and filmmakers to add to this, but that was kind of more their skill. My skill was, uh, my, my aim was to, how can I use language to generate that, that excitement? And um, I don't know whether I succeeded or not. You know, I gave it a really good try. <laughs> and um, <laughs> one of the best periods of my life doing it. And it was a great honor to, to meet Lucy as part of that process. Um, yeah, and, and vice versa. And I think the thing that I really like is that you gave character to the sun. I sort of felt a different part of its personality that I hadn't, felt through just looking at it's, it from a scientific point of view. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, 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 I was, you know, often what, you know, we all watch science fiction films and there's that ship in the background there. And it's a question I had never really thought about it with respect to the sun, but of course it's true of every object which is in outer space. How is it just hanging there? <laughs> now, you know, we as physicists can describe why it's there, but if everything in common experience is it's got to fall down somewhere, right? Anything we learn as a chimpanzee or as a primate, you know, for, for two million years, which is, informs all of our common sense in many ways. How does that spacecraft just sit there on the way to the sun? How does solar orbiter actually just not fall down? Now, you know, I mean, and I know that sounds a totally bizarre thing to say because it, it just doesn't. Think about that for a moment. Why doesn't it, right? As in common experience and, and making those connections where people can sort of viscerally feel something being completely different out of our experience, but then understanding it. I mean, quantum mechanics, of course, forget it, right? I mean, you're never gonna understand quantum mechanics in a visceral way, but just something as simple as the sun sitting there just in empty space and not, not going anywhere. I mean, okay, it's going around the galaxy, but you know what I mean, right? Why doesn't it fall down? Everything, I, everything falls down, right? This mouse falls down, it, it, it's what happens. How have we accepted this? I, I struggle with this occasionally, so that's why I'm... <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think it's a very interesting point, though. Um, if, if I could just interject, because something that Simon said I thought was just so stimulating, and he's absolutely right, there is something truly astonishing about a book when you really think about it, right? But I guess that's the, that's the value in art and self-expression, is it is like a filter on things, you know? And things that we take for granted, like the sun, you know, something that, you know, I mean, every day has a sunrise and a sunset, all that. We just, we're not always aware, we're not focused on those things, but I guess things like poetry can give us that filter where all of a sudden it's like, well, I never thought about it that way, right? And I guess that's what's so important, you know, is, you know, I think this is a human being to acknowledge the beauty of things as well. And um, I guess poetry helps us with that as well. Yeah. And I was able to write from the sun's point of view um, and the sun has no experience of sunrises or sunsets. So it was quite nice to switch it around that way. And so all these things you think are so important. Yeah. <laughs> You're just imposing that on me. And that's a projection. So we're yeah, just to yeah. Indeed, indeed. Yeah. So, so, so tell us a little bit about Sunspots, you know, and the, the writing process 
for that book? Because I guess you really had to combine so many different fields to, to, to find a way to, to bring all that together. Yeah, it was a really interesting experience for me because I, um, I wrote a book called, previous to, to Sunspots, called Neptune Blue, which was, uh, you know, a, a miscellaneous book of poetry, but it did have, um, in the middle, it had a kind of planet, it had a, like a, a plant, my own planet suite. I always loved Holt's planet suite when I was a little boy. My dad was a musician and me and my sister used to dance around to the planets every Saturday night when she was babysitting for me. And um, I'd always thought, well, you know, Holt has done that. And in 2020, I think 10, I said, I thought, well, actually, you know, I, I can do my, I can do a planet suite. I'll just do it in poetry. So I, I set myself the task of writing about each of the planets and quirky, different, challenging ways to try and make them interesting again. Um, it's one of the one of the uh, aims and goals of, of poetry, I think. Um, and then um, the book was ready to go and I had this weird niggling, nagging feeling that there's something wasn't quite right there. And I suddenly thought, hang on, isn't 99% of the mass of the solar system the sun, actually? Um, so, and that's the one thing I've missed out. It's like this massive blind spot. So I wrote this poem um, from the point of view of the sun, um, talking about her the errant children and quoting Shakespeare and doing all kinds of you know, strange things um, that you might not expect the sun to do. And there was something about this voice of this sun um, that I found so inspiring that I, I sent the book off and that was published, but I immediately wrote kind of 30 or 40 short quirky poems about the sun from the sun's point of view. And I immediately knew that my next book was going to be all about the sun. Um, and it was going to be called Sunspots and the poems wouldn't have titles. And I would make a, a theatrical show and do film and music from it. It was, it, it was like overnight, it was just the perfect, it just fell into my lap in a weird, a weird way. And so for the next three or four years, I, I wrote those poems and uh, I traveled, I got an Arts Council grant, thank you Arts Council England, to travel to the Solar Observatory in New Mexico and, um, and also to travel to Tromso in January where the sun doesn't appear. Because of course, when you're, in the, when you're in the throes of an obsession, the most interesting thing to do is to deprive yourself of the source of the obsession. So I thought, well, I'm crazy about the sun at the moment. What if I go somewhere for 10 days where it doesn't appear? what will that do to me? How will I feel? And that was incredibly inspiring and wonderful to talk to the people of, of Tromso about that. And, um, and then I, I started talking to Lucy because I realized at this point I needed to speak to an, an actual solar, um, uh, an astrophysicist, a uh, specialist in the sun. So we got talking and then I started working with her at the space lab. So it, it was from 2011 to 2015 um, this book kind of came together and uh, I was in a, a really fevered kind of state for, for a few years. Um, very happy state. I, I love this. Um, I think some of my friends thought I was a little bit crazy. You know, I, would, I, remember, I remember feeling really sad when the sun went down and I knew I was going to miss it all night. It was, it was really ridiculous. <laughs> um, and then this, this book was produced in a, a live show and, and, and various things. And, uh, and now I'm kind of, I kind of feel satisfied and sated. The, the obsession has passed, but uh, but I look back at it very fondly, and every now and then I get sparks of it again. But it really was a, a very intense kind of love affair, and I've, you know, we've, we've moved on to other things now. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yeah. We still we still think of each other very fondly. Um, well, I, I was going to pick up on that because, you know, I, Lucy's a fairly obsessed person in this regard as well. Maybe, maybe not with <laughs> yes. giving. Well, you know, you know, so so we. One of the things you know, I love we, most about her. Yeah. <laughs> we had um, uh, Daniel Muller and Miho Janvier on uh, uh, Uplink a couple of weeks ago, um, both scientists closely involved in the solar orbiter mission. Um, and as you know, you know, I, and I don't mean this in any negative way at, at, at all, but, you know, Daniel is, you know, he's, he's, he's the project scientist for ESA. He, you know, very solid guy. I mean, very, you know, all, all the good things, but sometimes the emotion, I don't, it's not quite there. I mean, it's like, we're on our way, but you know, it's kind of, you know, we've, we've passed the milestones. We're like, Lucy, you're different. You know, there's an emotionality about the, the sun and solar orbiter for you. And I've seen, I've seen you give oh, yeah. interviews. And, and so where does that come from? Is it, I mean, I'm not going to, I'm going to accuse you. Is, is it something you do because it's good outreach or is it, is it genuine? Is it inside your heart? It's just a genuine obsession. I think that, you know, perhaps maybe one of the reasons I became a scientist was a slightly obsessive character and um, my kind of eureka moment or eye-opening moment for the sun was being in the, um, at the Crimean Astrophysical Observatory. And we'd gone there to look at X-ray binaries. So this was as an undergraduate. And one of the ladies on that site um, running the telescope said, oh, I've got a solar telescope. 
why don't you come and have a look at the sun and and I looked you know through the telescope using a specialist filter at the sun I just I, I felt like I'd been cheated my whole life that nobody had told me how interesting the sun was and it was honestly in that moment that the obsession began I just felt I had to understand what I was looking at what kind of object the sun is why does it do what it does given it is the most important object for us in in the entire universe so it, it, it literally is an obsession and it's been that way for over 20 years so and, and also I think you know I, I'm so lucky I can do a job that feeds well not feeds the obsession maybe satisfies the obsession I don't want to get more obsessive so perhaps not. <laughs> um, but but I also remember when I joined the space lab I work at that um, you know, I looked around and thought, so by this point, I'd been sort of switched onto the sun and I, I, as an undergraduate, started studying it and I wanted to do a PhD in it. So I went to this space lab that I'm still at. And I remember just thinking, oh, my God, this is amazing. People here are studying all these astrophysical objects and they're building telescopes that get launched to go into space. How cool is that? But like you say, people were like, this is my job. I, I come to work. I do this. <laughs> I analyze, I build, and I just used to think, oh my God, this I have to tell people about what's happening in this weird, quirky Victorian mansion. Um, let's kind of open the doors and let people see what's being done and who's being done it. And let's allow ourselves a bit of time to feel enthusiastic about it as well. Yeah, I, it's been my experience that, you know, people, I, I don't know if it's deliberate, whether it's, it's not a, it's not that people don't have emotion or it's not that they've deliberately suppressed it. I mean, certainly there's a moment on the launch pad where years and years of work are about to go up. I mean, that, you, you know, now, you know, what mm -hmm. that feels like, right? I mean, that's, that's not pure joy until about eight minutes later, right? <laughs> or, or a couple of hours later. So obviously there's emotion attached to those moments, but yeah, I wonder what it is. And that's why we do do these artists in residency programs and space rocks as well is to not only for the public but actually for ourselves a little bit right is to allow ourselves to sort of feel a bit more and i don't i don't mean to be patronizing about my colleagues not in the slightest i mean many people are very emotional about what they do but but the public don't expect us to be so in some level that you know that it's link is cultural. broken yeah it's very cultural and i think it's very british as well because it's not necessarily the same in other areas of astrophysics and you, know, you go to america there's much more enthusiasm and I think that's often why the media like to have, for example, um, Americans to be uh, as their interviewees, because they more readily show that emotion and that passion and that personal side. So I, I think it's cultural. And, and when things are cultural, they take a long time to change, don't they? So it's important we have ambassadors to uh, sort of, I don't know, carry the torch for being who you are and, and being open with who you are and that that's that's absolutely what we want people to be we don't want people to feel hidden behind a you know a facade of seriousness and science that we have to you know be very um dogmatic and and not emotional about it. it is emotional and a lot of scientists are driven by that emotional um aspect and a sort of personal desire to understand so let's let's share that mm. And you, you work, sorry, just to pick up on one more thing there, you work quite closely with the amateur astronomy community as well. And, and it, it is one of those areas which is slightly odd, right? There, there, I, well, I, I may be wrong. I don't, I don't know of too many strong amateur particle physics associations in the world. Uh, or I mean, there are amateur geologists, yes. But I mean, astronomy has that weird thing that there is a very strong, very vibrant, let's call them amateur community, although in fact, the crossover these days is quite often, you know, much stronger than, than it used to be with modern technology. Um, do yeah. you think, you know, how how do you how, how have you seen that change is i guess what i'm getting to because in the past it was very it was a bit like going to a concert and there was the band on stage and there was you in the audience and the two didn't really meet but there are things that you do and things like astrofest where it's a lot more cross talk now okay we do stand on stage and talk but encouraging that interaction uh, between yeah. the communities yeah and i think that's so important and in in a way you know it's a shame that we have the terminology of professional astronomers and amateur astronomers because to me it's just one big community and we're using a range of telescopes range of sizes of telescopes you know for some people it's a job and for other people it's a passion and it's and it's a hobby uh, but i see us as one community and actually this is this is one area where i thought patrick moore was really hub where both communities came together, you know, watching Sky at night or going to his house down in Sussex, uh, sorry, in, um, uh, oh gosh, uh, down Sussex. south of Chichester. Yeah. It's Sussex. It is Sussex, isn't it? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Celsius is the word I was looking for. Yeah. Um, so, 
so I, I yeah and, and so having events like astrofest i think are really important because that's where we can bring everybody together and i'm very keen that we can have you know physical meetings where we all get together enthuse share ideas talk about the kit we're using talk about what we're seeing um and uh sorry i'm now i started rambling <laughs> i've got the back of what i wanted to say but but yeah i think we are we are in a very um lucky situation where we've got such a large number of people who are interested in passionate about the night sky and it's important to me to have opportunities to make sure everybody can come together and and what i love is that you know if you give me a telescope i you know i know sort of things to look at but really I love being around the amateur astronomers because their knowledge of the night sky is amazing and they're like Lucy Lucy look at this ah oh, Lucy Lucy look at this and and it's just you know not, night sky tour so impressive their knowledge and um, so I, I think everybody's got something to contribute you know I can help with discussions about the sun and they come in with a huge amount of knowledge and expertise themselves. Very good well I mean I, I guess that's you know so much of what Space Rocks is about um, you know, is, you know, in many ways, bridging worlds, you know, and uh, perhaps just widening things out. And I guess, as Simon, I thought, um, you know, said so powerfully at the beginning, I guess, just letting people know that they can be a part of this, um, mm. this fabric, you know, um, of wonder, you know, that all these things are interconnected, you know, in, in such really important ways. And now I, I have to put you on the spot, Simon, here, um, you know, just... Uh, uh, <laughs> a little bit, just because uh, you know, I just I just wondered what you thought were the best expressions of wonder in poetry when it comes to the night sky or the day sky. You know, we were just talking about the sun after all. I mean, uh, what, what what are those? I guess those milestones and things that we should look up. You you mentioned Samuel Beckett before. Yeah, well, well, th th that was more to do with kind of his strange sense of of, of space. I mean, you know, he's a he's a extraordinarily in inverted commas negative artist, but there's a lot of there's a lot of joy um, in in um, in his use of language, and um, you know he can write very um, austere, sparse, grim um, accounts of a certain kind of reality, solipsistic reality, as he sees it. And then in the middle of that, he might have a beautiful line like and oh and and, and above the oh a clouding blue, so he lets in these little shafts of light. Um, I really like Rebecca Elson's poetry. She was an actually, she was an astronomer and uh, and a really a really good poet. Um, her life was cut short by cancer, sadly around the age of about the age of thirty nine. But her collection from Carcanet, a responsibility to all, is um, is definitely worth uh, worth picking up if you're interested in in all these fields. Um, but it was the first thing I introduced at the Space Lab because it was the point where we all overlapped. You know, poets and scientists, and astronomers. We all overlapped through the the kind of vortex of Rebecca Elson, who who did all those jobs, did all those things together. Um, there's a wonderful anthology called Dark Matter, edited by Maurice O'Riordan, which is full of um, poems about cosmology and uh, and uh, the night sky um, and space. Uh, I'd urge people to to check that out. Um, that's kind of what comes to me right now. I don't have another. And, and of course, Just, I mean, as, as a teenager, I really did love, um, it's not very fashionable now, but I loved Wordsworth poetry, which has the sense of, of the sublime and of, and of wonder and of capaciousness in space and, and the vastness of the sky. And that was something, um, when I was growing up in Yorkshire, I was... Um, I was just out of the town centre, but we, we had a massive playing field in front of our house. You could fit something like six football pitches on there and it wasn't lit up at all. And so I would go out there and lie down on my back and look up at the sky and we had proper dark skies there. And it was that sense of um, seeing, you know, millions of stars and satellites and wondering what they were. Um, and Wordsworth kind of has, has, has some of that, that tone as well. So. Yeah, I was just very, bri very briefly worried about millions of satellites. We're only going to have more of those spoiling the night sky. <laughs> well, millions of stars, I mean, really. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was just, just the reason I just briefly went on mute, I just want to remind myself of the full title. I, um, through Space Rocks, I've been working with various artists and musicians, but and, and through that, then following on to other things. So I was working uh, recently uh, with a, a musician called Anna Phoebe, uh, who's a violinist, but she's working with a poet uh, called Selena Godden, um, and just oh, yeah. had a, a poem very recently called and the moon don't talk to me anymore uh it's it's, it's a political piece i mean the moon is yeah, there as a backdrop to, to 
Yeah, and it's, you know, if you hear her read it out, and I think Anna is playing music to it. Mm. Um, but we, we did a thing together where we were, it was the York Festival, what, what is it now? Festival of Ideas at York. And this year it was held virtually. So we did a, a kind of a pre-recording and, and, and connecting people together, speaking to artists and as we do in Space Rocks, but then, you know, people, the network is just growing and growing and growing. And I'm almost overwhelmed by the network of people who are interested in the various topics, not, not space at the middle of it, but space as a part of a bigger picture. Mm. So I'm wondering, you know, how much you working together as, as a, at, at MSSL, has that led on to then because you've met Lucy or you've met Simon that then other things have come from that, that networking effect that it didn't just sort of go away afterwards or wasn't confined to this, just the pair of you? Um, I've certainly, since working with Lucy at the Space Lab, I've certainly done other collaborations with um, with uh, scientists and uh, and artists of all stripes. There's um, there's a very interesting group called Lumen, um, based in London. Um, uh, Louise Beer and Melanie, um, Melanie, Melanie King. King. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, photographers and visual artists. You know, I've worked with yeah. them. Um, we work, work together. Um, and things like this come along, you know. So I've, I've, uh, I've certainly done more work of a similar nature on the back of working with Lucy. Um, I don't know whether what Lucy's um, take is on. Yeah, I think it's all been of the culture change that I wanted to see in the department of the way we think and the way we act and who we are as a community. So that has been that has had a lasting legacy. And you see that then in sort of maybe more in the outreach activities that we do, but it's sort of in a, in a way of thinking and conversations that people have in the department. And then, um, you know, more poetry has been written. So people have carried on writing poetry, which has been amazing. And um, one of the uh, research fellows there, Tom Kitching, then had his own book of poetry that he, yes. that he wrote and Simon worked with him and, and, and it was published. So it's, you know, those seeds that were sown have have carried on and they've carried on into maybe, you know, some very tangible ways like Tom's poetry, but then in the kind of cultural changes and shifts and mindset shifts that, that I was hoping would happen and actually could happen. Yeah, Tom was a real was a real natural, a real find, I think. He, um, yeah. I remember him coming to me early on saying, Simon, is it OK if I do this? Is this a poem? I was like, that's the kind of thing I was thinking of talking about in about 12 months time. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely, keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, that was just great to draw that out of the woodwork, you know, literally out of the woodwork in our old Victoria mansion was yeah. quite and he used a lot of a lot of his a lot of his maths and a lot of code and science was were in his poetry. He, he made poetry out of the code that he was he was analyzing, you know, distant cosmological events from, which uh -huh. for me was yeah. was wonderful. I take I take as much credit as I can, but really it was all down to him. <laughs> You know, I, I, I don't want to pry too much here, but, you know, and I, I think in many ways we're speaking the same language um, on this, but have you faced obstacles? Have you had either of you, you know, just in your work together, people saying, you know what, you know, I don't agree with all this, you know, um, you know, people questioning the legitimacy of, of bringing these worlds together? Because, you know, I'd like to imagine everybody just that it's just self-evident mm -hmm. these things are important, but I just wondered if people have stood in the way as well. I've had no one really express it eloquently, but I've certainly had reactions and facial expressions and yeah. and, and blank stares, definitely, and and the, and a little bit of resistance, even with, even with the people who were taking part in what we were doing in the space lab. You know, they were. I think some of them joined because they wanted to they wanted to experience a little bit of that friction. And I think for some people, it was a, it was a little bit difficult getting the two worlds to come together. So it's it's definitely there. Um, Lucy's probably heard more because she's probably had to go on committees and defend um, <laughs> all kinds of financial <laughs> arrangements. So she's got more of this, put, put more eloquently. So, Well, I was thinking, I mean, it, it's a long process, I think, of making successful partnerships. And so I didn't really feel too many barriers um, when Simon was um, part of the community with us. But prior to that, so several years before that, I had worked with an artist and we did a storytelling event. And the idea was to, again, to kind of democratize the voices. So it wasn't an expert talking to 
somebody who was uninformed and we had this it was a really lovely evening at sunset we walked around the grounds of where we were we'd made lanterns and we had these stopping off points you know we had like an African drummer and we had fire pits and, and we walked around and when, when we stopped everyone told their stories and it was about experiences and passions and feelings rather than facts you know it wasn't a I'm going to tell you a fact about solar orbiter it was you know like, oh I just love launches because they look so visceral or whatever it was and then um, when we were setting up that project someone came to me and said um Lucy storytelling is for children I don't think it's a Gosh. in the department <laughs> <laughs> like ah <laughs> and then the other thing I had from people who were wanting to take part was well Lucy what story would you like me to tell mm. and I was like no no this is free this is for you but I think they were so used to me saying oh you know could you come and give a talk about this mission you work on and me being quite pres prescriptive and then when we were doing something that was much more open everyone was out of their comfort zones like oh I'm not really sure can I really voice my opinion and my feelings like this or shall I stick to my comfort zone and just show a presentation and talk about the facts that we've learned about this mission to study whatever um, object in the solar system and but but it's definitely changed and I think that's partly because you know we do initiatives and, and we work together more and partly actually because younger generations are coming through and they think completely differently so that overall yeah. Ooh, that combination i think it's been fantastic yeah i think we've experienced something similar <laughs> that people have it hasn't always been true but you know people have come to accept that outreach is a fundamental thing that we do that we should tell the public what it is that we do because they're paying for us um i still consider un unfortunately outreach is kind of the compressible air at the top of a room being filled with incompressible water it's always the first thing to be sort of chopped because the engineering and everything just squeezes it I, i've always said that outreach should be a metal plate at the bottom of the room which cannot be touched you put that money in first and do it and then mm -hmm. you know the budget above that is going to is going to fluctuate by a lot but I think with the art and science connections, we're still in that domain a little bit where people, as you say, it's a bit frivolous. It's not really what we do. Um, it has because it's as we've been talking about, it's as much actually about in reach as it is, it is about outreach. It's important that we talk to the public and engage the public. It's about who we are and how that might mm. affect what we do, whether it's a poet or a scientist. Um, and I think people are kind of slightly resistant to that change. Oh, you're asking me now to do something which is outside my comfort zone. Talking to the public, yes, I understand why we have to do that, and fine, off you go and do that. But but having artists on site, what does that bring to me? It's like, well, you're the one person that should probably do it then, right? Because you, you're the one person who had, will have something to gain from it. Yeah, yeah, and I, I definitely noticed the change after um, Simon was with us, that the way people communicated with each other and the sort of more openness. So I, it, you're right in a chance to reflect and, and poetry definitely gives you that chance to be reflective and a bit introspective um, in a way that we don't necessarily get with science and that grows you as an individual and grows you as a community too. Yeah I think it's particularly important today as we're looking for new voices uh, as you said the younger generation coming through take, definitely have a different outlook but but we are still at the top of the system and still, you know, management structures are set the way they were 20, 30, 40 years ago. And uh, if we don't kind of loosen up properly and open up at the top, it's going to take even longer than it needs to for that diversity and uh, new ways of thinking to come through. And I think, you know, we're just cutting ourselves off from a, a community of people. It goes right back to the beginning. People who said, oh, well, that's not for me because I'm not a white, a white old man smoking a pipe. It's like, no, you're 15. So, you know, <laughs> the world is still there for you. Um, so, so, so those role models again, and I know, certainly in the UK, the role models have changed, I think, quite a lot in the last 20 years. In other countries, not so much. You'll see sort of old white men still being the role models for science in some countries. Uh, but the UK has come a long way, I think, in that regard. I mean, I mean there's so much about what we're talking about, you know, um, uh, if, if we call it disruption or just challenging, you know, inherited ways of doing things. Um, you know, uh, something that, because uh, of course we have other people in the room, people watching us online. Um, you know, Dawn said, well, you know what, I did a math degree and nobody at my all school, uh, all girls school suggested that I should go on to physics or astrophysics, you know, so it's, it's, mm. it's not even just, you know, bringing the arts and sciences together, is it? It's also maybe changing the way things are taught, you know, I mean, because so much education for many people is vocational, you know, um, you know, because, you know, people aren't necessarily encouraged. And so it, it, it feels like 
there is something very um, important going on when we do these things and when we shake things up a little bit because it, it forces us to question assumptions. And, mm. and it's interesting that much of this evening has centered around education, you know, I mean, mm. you know, and, and, and just when people first encounter these things and not just education when you're a kid, you know, um, ongoing learning, you know. As, yeah. as you said, I'm fascinated by this, this phrase that Lucy used earlier of lifelong education, of course. The only reason we have the concept of lifelong education is because there's a concept uh, in the past that education stops at a certain point, you know, whether, it, whether, it's, whether it's 16, 18 or 22. Um, so then we have to invent this other thing, which is lifelong. Well, actually, you know, it's, it goes, and we shouldn't even have that expression, really. It shouldn't exist. It's like education is here. It's like breathing. It goes on. And, and these are the structures that allow it to happen, whether you're working, not working, whatever transition you're going through, raising families, or you know, we need to possibly rethink that whole, and maybe the period we're living through at the moment might, might be a good well, time uh, to, to start, you know, okay. brainstorming some of those, some of those patterns. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, how is how has the last four or five months affected the the space lab, Lucy? Do you know what's been? Is it closed down? Are things working differently? Or um, yeah, working very creatively actually. So yeah. so we talked about the Solar Orbiter mission, and that satellite launched just before lockdown, like a month and a half before, and all the instruments had to be commissioned basically during the early days of lockdown. So people were finding really creative ways, you know, webcams in certain rooms. So someone across, you know, the continent could watch what was happening on a computer at ESA. So they could then say, right, this is what we need to do with our instruments. We've had um, engineers take work home with them, you know, doing space electronics from their front rooms and all, all just, just finding a way to keep going. Mm. And so even though it's been locked down, uh, the work has carried on, which is, I, quite frankly remarkable I was expecting most of it would stop but e ESA won't let us stop really because we've got time to stick to <laughs> deadline. Yeah. So, uh, but get on with it <laughs> yeah we did briefly had to shut solar orbiter down and a couple of the other missions um solar orbiter just been launched and and it was sort of put into it was on its way there was you know it wasn't stopped moving um because we had a case of coronavirus on site uh at uh, our mission control in, in Darmstadt in Germany and because of you know who that person might have met there was people were removed from site for a, a few weeks uh but then brought on and, and we had you know when we had Daniel on a few weeks ago he talked uh, there, there he did actually get emotional actually I would say you know about how impressed he was with how the community had come together mm -hmm. uh, and figured out ways I mean was, where Lucy was just saying you know pointing a webcam at a computer you might ask well why don't you just relay the signal from the computer well we can't because it's behind the security wall to stop people interacting with the spacecraft but you people need to see the results normally they'd be in the room watching it but if you can't be mm. how do you do that mm. um i think the one the one effect that i'm sure you've seen it in the lab too and we've all seen it in our personal lives and it's a longer term thing is although we can work and we can do this we can meet online and interact i think the longer term issue of not meeting our friends and our colleagues and people and being able perhaps to do art projects you know it may be harder to do it by the medium of zoom be creative because that that's a very human thing right sharing those experiences uh, we can we can talk about it here but it, you know could could you run the same sort of activity simon that you ran at, at, at mssl could you run that now in a virtual space it may be not in the same way right so i think there's the danger of a sort of growing apart yeah. slightly yeah it would be very different, but um, you know, I, I sometimes teach for the poetry school base here in London, and they've shifted all their courses now uh, online. You know, so so people are learning new ways, and I'm sure discovering new positives about the you know the the, the, the situation. But yeah, it would be um, yeah, it'd be very very different, I think. Um, and for me to be deprived of going out there to to this amazing space out in the countryside, I mean that was you know when I went in every kind of two weeks, and I would go on this amazing odyssey from from Bethnal Green in East London out to down to Waterloo, then on the train, and then get in a in a car with space lab on the side, and then up into the stick through the winding roads, which sometimes were shut off from from rain, and we had deer, you know, bouncing out in front of the car. So, and I wrote about that stuff, you know, and that was it before I even got there. So, yeah. so you know, it sounds like an, an episode of the Avengers or something, you know, yeah, bowler hats yeah, out absolutely. in. <laughs> Completely, yeah. A kind of like a really weird eccentric English strangeness, you know, it was, uh, it was uh, so, we'd, so we'd miss all that, you know. Be a much shorter commute, obviously, but yeah, it would be, it would be a much drier uh, um, situation, I think. But it could be done, of course, and you would, 
if you knew that if you knew those were the conditions, you would come at it in a, in, in a different way, a more multimedia way. You know, so it could yeah. be. Yeah, it wouldn't be the best time to do, but it could definitely be that. But I'm supposed to be on a, a traveling through the former Yugoslavia at the moment on a funded trip, but that that was all closed down. Um, so I don't know when when we'll do that. Maybe next year, maybe the year after. I don't know. So it's uh, a lot of things have been you know affected and changed, and suspended. Indeed, mm -hmm. indeed. Well, I think it's um, one of uh, um, the uh, uh, greatest things about collaborations and bringing people together, just as we have, is, is that it opens up so many more doors, you know, just ways of thinking, um, ways of um, collaborating. And, uh, you know, I, I have to say, I, I've so enjoyed this conversation. I hope it's just the beginning, because I would love to further explore ways that we can, we can do that, you know, I mean, that, that's what Space Rocks is all about. And, um, and we've just so enjoyed having you on behalf of everyone at Space Rocks and everyone who's been watching tonight, can I just say, Lucy and Simon, thank you so much for joining us on uh, the hot evening in the UK. So, um, so yeah, very <laughs> appreciated indeed. Thank you very uh, much. Yeah, that was and really fun. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Before we go, we just have again, it's partly about branding and visuals, but also just a sort of symbol we came up with earlier on. Um, we get everybody to do it. Uh, actually, the one person we haven't, we didn't get to do it was uh, Tony Daniel C three PO from Star Wars because it involved oh. starting with Star Trek hand signal, uh, oh. the Vulcan salute, live long and prosper, space, and then the horns for rocks. So if uh, this is, yeah, practice your finger movements now, Lucy. Think about it. Oh my god! Yeah, Alec, see, Alex has done it twenty one times. Doing with us. So am I doing it right? That's one. Yeah. And that That's would be perfect, other, right. perfect, very good. So Space Rocks, thank you very much. Very good. Yeah, so, bye. Thank you so much. <laughs> be well. Yeah. And, uh, and please stay in touch. Okay. <laughs> Thanks very, very much. Bye. See you later. Bye bye. bye. Okay. There we go. And there we go. Mark, we're gonna stay oh, after yes. this. another minute. Yeah, uh, we have we haven't done this before, have we? No, 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 but I think it's it's only uh, you know. I think it's very much in keeping with what we do that we, um, you know, we continue to evolve and adapt and do some cool things. Um, and uh, um, well, on the tail end of uh, 21 episodes, uh, you know, I have, um, you know, a lot of excitement about the, the 22nd one as well. And so I think we just wanted to give everyone who's stuck with us tonight a bit of a a preview, you know, uh, something special yeah. for everyone that's, that's shared this moment. So, so next week, Something pretty cool is happening on that place. Yeah. So we've, you know, we were talking about in, in the episode about making connections and and and, and uh, extending those connections and, and bouncing off. Um, uh, and you and I have had an idea in mind for a while, and uh, it, it's worked out, which is to get two of the coolest fighter pilots, um, uh, one real and one imagined, uh, to come on and uh, talk about what they've done in their lives um not not as fighter pilots as such um uh, and uh so one of them may be well known uh, as a fighter pilot to many uh people from the european space agency side and that's samantha christopheretti uh italian astronaut she was a, a pilot before she joined us uh, around 11 years ago and of course was on the space station for six months um and a, and a couple of years ago she and I were at a science fiction convention and we were lucky enough to meet one of the uh, hottest fighter pilots um, in uh, science fiction, um, Kyra Thrace, uh, Starbuck from Battlestar Galactica, better known, of course, as Katie Stackoff. So next week's uplink, uh, Samantha and Katie will be here in the same time slot as we had this evening, because, of course, Katie's in uh, Los Angeles. So I think that promises to be uh, really exciting. They're both incredibly, you know, brilliant, vibrant people uh, melding those words together. So I'm, I'm very excited for next week. So say we all. Um, well, <laughs> thank you guys so much to everyone who watched tonight and joined us in support Space Rocks and Uplink. And uh, Mark, we'll see you at the same time next Friday. Um, I'm going to watch Absolutely. Right now then. Very Looking good. forward to it. I've got a week to make a, a new backdrop. So uh, you're, you're stuck <laughs> with that one. <laughs> all right. Uh, see good. you soon. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.